Yeah. So. Um, yeah. So thanks, Chris, for, for passing it over. I also wanted to introduce my clinical counterparts, um, Ivy Altamari and Trevor Royce. Uh, we are, again, thrilled to be here presenting on our Colorado and Flatiron partnership. Um, specifically today, we'll talk through the real world data research data sets available to you all um, and walk through a little bit about what um, the data models look like, as well as how to access the data. Um, but I'll turn it over to Ivy first to introduce herself. Hey, Chris, great to see you again. Hi, everyone. I'm Ivy Altamari. I am one of the medical directors at Flatiron. I am a medical oncologist by training, and I am the, um, the clinical point for our Colorado partnership. It's really great to have the opportunity to present to you all today. And Trevor is also going to be assisting as a clinical uh, lead for the partnership. Trevor, you want to quickly introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Abby. I'd be happy to. It's nice to see everybody. Thanks for having us. <clears throat> My name is Trevor Royce, radiation oncologist by training, still clinically active, and a medical director at Flatiron with a health services and health policy expertise and a clinical background in genital urinary cancers. Glad to be here. Over to you, Giselle. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, so let me share my screen. So um, I'll let Ivy first go into the Flatiron overview, and then we'll take some time for questions, um, not only about our, our database, but also the company as a whole. Um, I know we're new to you all, so want to use this time um, together to answer any questions you might have about Flatiron. Um, and then finally, we'll end with the research process overview, our proposal-based process for accessing the data, and walk everyone through that. Um, I see that I think this meeting is being recorded, but I'll also follow up with some materials after um, to get everyone uh, involved. Um, so Ivy, I'll pass to you. Perfect. Yeah, um, hopefully I will be brief. Um, and uh, for those of you who are less familiar with our partnership or even our company, um, this is our mission statement. So Flatiron is a health tech company. We were founded in 2012. Um, with the mission to improve lives by learning from the experience of every cancer patient. And the way that we do this is to maintain one of the largest and most comprehensive databases of real world data uh, for cancer patients. So here's a little bit about our company. Um, we have a large team, almost a thousand full-time employees comprised of clinicians, engineers, and data scientists. And then we have another 1500 or so part-time abstractors to build and maintain the data sets that I uh, am about to show you. Um, our, uh, thank you, Giselle. Our research database includes um, patient information from almost 3 million active patients seen at 800 unique sites of care across the entire United States. Here is a geographic representation um, of our data footprint. So we pull patient data basically from two sources, from community practices through users of Flatiron's proprietary electronic health record system, which is called Onco EMR, um, and then through integrations with our seven academic partner institutions of which University of Colorado is one, and we are working on your integration as we speak. Next slide. So our partnership really has two elements. Um, today, I'll just be discussing um, the, the research element, your access to our research grade de-identified data sets. But just to mention, um, our partnership does include um, access to certain value-based care and really quality assessment tools that are powered by the local and national data that we collect. So I won't be talking about that tonight, but would love to at a later date for anyone who might be interested. So what makes our data sets unique is that they include structured data that is imputed directly from the defined fields in an electronic health record, such as gender, vital signs, visit date, um, medication doses, anything that is structured, but we also capture unstructured data that is taken from text in documents, such as the clinic notes or pathology reports or radiology reports, or even scanned documents from an outside vendor or an outside institution. Next slide. So the unstructured data capture 
is accomplished by that workforce of the 1500 trained abstractors that I mentioned earlier. And most of our abstractors have background as either oncology nurses or tumor registrars. So they're very familiar with the content of what's in a cancer patient's chart. And so we use a proprietary machine learning system to rapidly search all of the available records in a patient's electronic chart for key terms that are relevant to the sought after variables in our data dictionary and that surfaces the documents for the abstractors to, to look at, which enhances the efficiency and the quality of that manual abstraction. Next slide. So, um, you know, to just uh, describe a little bit more in detail the process of unstructured data capture, you know, we know that for cancer treatment, most critical information is really in PDF reports, such as. CAT scan reports or pathology reports. Um, so in this case, a trained abstractor would, would look at like this CAT scan and transfer any key relevant data points such as the presence of metastatic disease or the sites of metastases or progression, et cetera, um, and would really capture that information and enter it into a computerized data capture form that then interfaces with our database. Next slide. So our individual disease-based data sets each have approximately 150 variables um, pop populated by both structured and unstructured data. So here are some typical um, examples of variables. You can see what's included. Um, you know, it's the uh, standard things. I will say for staging, which is listed here, um, TNM staging and also diagnosis are independently manually reviewed and confirmed for each individual patient. So for our data sets, we don't base diagnosis on ICD codes. Um, all of those are manually confirmed. We do have very detailed treatment information, including IV and oral drugs. Um, dates of administration, duration of administration, and then we have lines of therapy. So we have the abstractors under our business rules assign a line of therapy and they can determine the use if it was first line metastatic maintenance. Um, and then we do have guidance in our knowledge center if you wanna see what those rules are to define a line of treatment for your research. Um, all of our data sets have mortality at scale as well. So the next slide, um, it says a little bit about this mortality variable. It's a composite endpoint of aggregated data from multiple sources. So we have three. We use data from the electronic health record, but you know, quite often the date of death is actually missing in an electronic health record. So this is cross-referenced with a commercial database of obituaries and then with the social security death index. So with those three sources, we feel that we are better able to capture the date of death accurately. And we have published analyses validating our real world overall survival composite endpoint against the United States gold standard um, of the national death index benchmark. And we have found a high level of sensitivity and specificity with this methodology. So the next slide shows the 21 de-identified disease-based data sets. Solid tumors here are in black, heme malignancies are in blue. Um, and these are the data sets that you now have access to. Um, the data recency is 30 days, meaning that data on all patients in these cohorts are refreshed every 30 days. So new information, such as new treatment information or new pathology, um, it's all refreshed every 30 days as patients are seen in the practices or even new patients um, are seen in the practices. And to give you an idea of the size of these cohorts, um, I just looked this morning, advanced non-small cell lung cancer has about 75,000 patients. Um, follicular lymphoma, which is one of our newer data sets, has about 6,000 patients. Um, and so the types of analyses that we see, 
Um, I'll just mention really quickly patterns of care studies, outcome studies, comparative effectiveness, biomarker discovery, um, and disparities research. Are there any questions for Ivy or Trevor about the data models? Um, they've worked a ton with the, the data sets and um, really are a wealth of knowledge. So would welcome any questions now before I get into the proposal process. Any um, notes, Chris, from your first project? Any uh, tips? Yeah, no, I think it's uh, really straightforward. As soon as the Flatiron team is done, we'll also kind of go into our local processes uh, as well as our joint steering committee. Um, but uh, having test run uh, the process <laughs> has been uh, pretty easy, honestly, and uh, Flatiron has been really easy to work with. So um, I think the whole point here is, uh, right, doing the literature search to see if anything's already been done in the space, but then uh, coming up with ideas and asking questions. That's That's what we really need. Yeah. Do you guys have sequencing data? So um, there are biomarkers that are involved in each of these data sets. Um, and you know, it's a, it's a loaded question. Um, we weren't going to get into this too much tonight, but we do have a, a, a database that links full genomic sequencing from foundation medicine with our clinical variables. And you also do have access to that. That is separate from these 21 disease-based data sets. Um, that is a clinical genomic data set, but you guys are already thinking ahead and uh, wanna do the most advanced stuff. So yes, there, there is a data set that has complete sequencing and each of these do have the most common relevant biomarkers as variables. Um, it's just some of the the, the uh, more rare ones that that are not at scale in these disease-based data sets, but the clinical genomic data set would have them. Thank you. Yeah, great yeah, question. There's a, a short one pager that I can send out about the genomics database, um, so you can review it offline. Um, but we recommend starting with the EDMs just because the genomics database is a linked data set. So an understanding of the flat iron data models really helps lay the foundation for you know the combined data set but happy to send that out too. Thanks for bringing that up. And really the, the most common relevant biomarkers, you know, if there's any targeted um, approved therapy that is biomarker driven for any of these diseases, we have it at scale in, the, in these. Um, it's really mm -hmm. just the smaller, more rare variants um, where the sequencing becomes important. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so let me get into a little bit about how our uh, proposal process works. As you can see here, um, it a, seems like a lengthy process, but we hope to expedite this just because we have a standard review cycle each month. Um, so what we ask folks to do, and I'll uh, get um, into the demo of our platform in a moment, um, but we have uh, proposals submitted via Flatiron Explore, which is um, our kind of uh, project management tool where you can see where your project is at each stage of the, pro the process outlined here. Um, so proposals are submitted through that platform, and then we have a monthly review cycle um, in which we provide feedback um, or provide approval to projects. Um, usually, especially with the first projects, we do a bit of back and forth for fe general feasibility, usually minor updates um, just based on our data models and our uh, quantitative scientists and research oncologists um, really provide a lot of uh, in-depth feedback about how the project could be made more feasible. Um, so that looks uh, like step two. Um, and as Chris mentioned earlier, we do uh, incorporate a uh, Colorado review process. So there is a joint steering committee um, comprised of both Flatiron and uh, Colorado leadership. Um, and we ask that all proposals are reviewed by the Colorado joint steering committee as well as the Flatiron um, uh, feasibility review committee. Uh, after both of those bodies have approved the proposal, um, we go to the contracting stage. Um, we have standard uh, statements of work that have already been pre-negotiated with Colorado. So we um, slot the proposal in there. Um, as you probably can imagine, we provision access to each of these data sets um, only by the proposal. So um, if, in better terms, we are only able to contract for the exact methodology and um, research question um, before we can deliver data. After that contracting, we ask um, for a copy of the internal IRB, so the Colorado IRB, just um, so we can ensure that all of uh, the Flatiron IRB is being kept up to date as well. 
Um, and then that's uh, data delivery. So once these contracting and the IRB are uploaded into Flatiron and Explore, the platform automatically triggers data delivery within five business days. Um, we also provide uh, analysis support. So after receiving your data delivery, we have um, folks on our team that can answer questions. Um, Ivy referred to the Knowledge Center before, before, which is a wealth of knowledge about not only our EDMs, but also the clinical genomic database that we talked about a bit. Um, and then publication review. So we ask that uh, Flatiron reviews publications going out, not only manuscripts, but any conference abstracts, posters, presentations, um, anything that's being shared externally. Um, we do review some internal pro projects as well, but this is mainly you know, for external publications. Um, and that process does take 14 days on the Flatiron side. Um, so for example, our ASCO deadlines tomorrow, we ask that uh, Flatiron PIs submit their projects um, or abstracts, excuse me, um, 14 days previously. So we can have time to ensure database characterization language is um, consistent across all uh, publications, um, as well as just ensuring that um, the deli data delivery was used for the specific research question and methodology that was approved by Flatiron and the Joint Steering Committee. Um, so the proposal process can vary just depending on how many rounds of feasibility we have to go through um, and, of course, any questions on the back end or front end. Um, but normally we usually see data delivery within 90 days of proposal submission. Um, and then analysis is really, as you can imagine, up to uh, the PI. So let me put some color to this. Um, this is uh, some screenshots and all live demo as well, the Flatiron Explore platform. Um, uh, I can send out the link for access after this uh, meeting as well, just to, so you can start getting in there and playing around with the Knowledge Center, seeing as Ivy mentioned all the cohort sizes. This is an excellent tool to start thinking about research questions. Um, the uh, Knowledge Center, or sorry, the Flatiron Explore portal houses the Knowledge Center as well as a tool that we call Flatiron Render. It really allows you to play around with the data sets and kind of filter out um, exactly down to your research question to see the cohort size that um, you'd be working with at the end. Um, so let me just switch over here. Um, so this is what Flatiron Explorer looks like when you log in. Um, you'll come to this homepage and this um, front page just outlines exactly what I just described, um, the, part, the whole research process, process from front to end. Um, coming up to explore data, this is where you can download all of our data dictionaries. Again, really, we really encourage investigators to get a feel for the data before submitting a proposal, just so you can know the uh, limitations as well as you know the feasibility of the cohort sizes you'd be working with. Um, up here is research projects, so um, kind of going uh, right to in, in the process, submitting um, on this page here. You can, will come to this page and you'll be able to download your proposal template using this button. Um, it'll download right to your desktop in a, in a Word document. And then once you've um, been able to uh, fill out the template, you will come over to admin projects or um, my projects and you'll be able to submit. Um, I'm in a demo view, which is why it's not showing me the submit button. Oh, actually, here it is. Start new research project. So you'll um, fill out all these self-explanatory fields and upload that Word document proposal document, which is what um, kind of we use the Flatiron team to send back and forth comments and track changes. Um, we also have space down here for um, all of the investigators, statisticians, anyone affiliated with the project um, can be added to the Flatiron Explore uh, project management tool, just so everyone's aware of what stage the, pro the project is at, whether that be the proposal phase, um, maybe it's waiting for JSC review or um, publication review. Um, we really recommend everyone on the project to be um, added here just so they get the automated emails and everyone can stay in the loop. Um, and then I guess the last thing we can look at here is our knowledge center. Um, so this is just a very brief um, list of some of the articles that we have. Um, it looks like it's kicking out of my Okta, but let me show you from the beginning. So once you um, sign up for Flatiron Explore Access, you'll be prompted to um, 
up for an Okta password, which will um, allow you to have a, a password that you verify on your phone as a, as a single sign-on. So this is pushing an update to my phone right now. And then it'll just have me do my dual authentication and log me right back in. Um, so you will be able to search any topic or keyword here, and it'll bring you to all of the articles um, that our partner solutions folks have um, written on pretty much anything under the sun with our data models, um, what's available in each of them. Ivy mentioned the lines of therapy articles are extremely helpful, um, and it's a great place to start if um, you're wondering if a particular project will be feasible. Um, something I also, actually, let me pause here first. Are there any questions about the proposal process? The software makes it pretty straightforward, but just wanna make sure I'm not missing anything. Okay. So the only other piece I wanted to mention um, was that we really encourage grant applications with Flatiron Data and our team is super supportive um, and would love to collaborate or uh, work together on um, your application. We have a few things um, in the works as we start to put together a more consolidated, you know, grant support program. Uh, we've started doing a curated list of grants for which Flatiron data uh, might be appropriate to address a primary or secondary aim. That goes out biannually. We just had one go out in Q4, so our next one will come out um, sometime in early April. Uh, we also are happy to provide letter of support describing Flatiron's data sets and confirming our feasibility review process. We can do that either, either before feasibility or after the feasibility review process. Um, we'll just edit the letter of support um, to reflect where we are in the proposal process. Um, but this uh, is something that has been helpful to investigators in the past, um, just for the, again, the characterization of the Flatiron data set and a little bit more information about Flatiron and, and our real world data. Um, and we also have several Knowledge Center articles uh, that outline some templated language that can be included directly in grant applications. Um, so there's a few pieces of feedback that we've heard from other investigators and we've tried to work um, towards template, templated language that can be used to, um, again, describe the characterization, the limitations, um, and some of the ways that we've addressed them in our data models. Um, so we found that these have been helpful resources thus far and um, really encourage grant applications with our data. That is actually all I have, but would love to open the floor again for any last questions for any of the three of us, or Chris, anything you wanted to know? Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll dive a little bit more into the CU specifics, but wanted to see if anybody on the uh, call wanted to ask the Flatiron team anything about the database. Chris, I'm just wondering if you can share with us the type of uh, project you have. Yeah, so uh, the, the one that I looked at uh, was looking at stage two colon cancer and looking at treatment uh, outcomes for stage two, because that's a gray area in colorectal cancer adjuvant therapy in terms of who gets uh, treatment and who doesn't. And uh, one of our hypotheses was that uh, early onset colorectal cancer, those patients may uh, actually be overtreated uh, because of their age. Uh, now, this is an interesting thing, right, with a database, because a lot of databases is mainly uh, metastatic when it comes to colorectal cancer. And so we're actually kind of inferring from the metastatic group uh, who actually received chemotherapy uh, from uh, who were originally diagnosed with stage two. But Flatter is able to kind of tease that out. They can tease it out by age. They can look at the treatment that they received, and we can look at differences uh, certainly by age, but even some of the uh, uh, pathologic or clinical risk factors that patients have. So, um, you know, uh, so essentially what I did was fill out the form uh, and then send in the flat iron. They actually gave us some feedback. Uh, we resubmitted it and um, now we're getting data. So. Great to start with a super interesting, really well-written research proposal. I, I think one of the, the things, <laughs> yeah, well, I think that the key right, with the first project was just to kind of step on as many lame lines as possible. I would just say really what we want our investigators to use the database, right? Uh, and we'll kind of go through this, but um, there's no cost to this other than the biostatistical analysis. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit, but um, we want you to ask questions. These are perfect projects to work with, uh, with trainees uh, or honestly, anybody interested in doing any cancer research um, and to do that with a senior mentor. So we just want people to ask questions and 
uh, present at ASCO and get publications. And um, you know, this this helps everybody involved. I guess one question I have um, was that on that list of diseases that was presented, I saw metastatic colon cancer, but I didn't see early stage. Yeah, so that was actually one of the elements where um, when Chris submitted his idea, we were able to scope it out at Flatiron and really see the cohort within the cohort. So, you know, our, our metastatic colorectal cancer um, disease set has about 30,000 patients. And so we had to go back and look and see how many of those patients were actually progressed after being treated with stage two disease, because that was the population in the cohort that Chris was look, um, interested in looking at. And we found that we did have a sizable number, thousands of patients, I forget the exact number, Chris, but it was thousands of patients that actually were diagnosed initially with stage two disease. Um, and then, and then recurred after that and progressed to metastatic disease. So there were enough patients in the disease set to actually kind of be able to answer his question and stratify the age diagnosis. Yeah. And I'm just, this is from explore, right. And this is actually metastatic breast cancer, but you can kind of see even the stage at initial diagnosis within this metastatic cohort that there are thousands of patients that are diagnosed with stage one, two or three uh, breast cancer. There's actually an early breast cancer cohort uh, that Flatiron has as well. Uh, but to kind of give you an idea, right? I mean, these are like the treatments <laughs> these patients have, you know, and you can see how powerful this is, right? You're looking at two lines of therapy and, uh, you know, each size is 24,000 patients or 15,000 patients. So it's really impressive. Um, you know, we, we basically really want to get you access to Flatiron Explorer so you can just play around with the data uh, and hopefully that elicits some questions and, you know, you guys can start using it. Uh, other questions? And thanks so much for having us. And uh, we'll definitely send all of these resources uh, over email and uh, welcome questions. So looking forward to chatting with you all. Great. No, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure we'll continue uh, these conversations and we'll continue to introduce this to investigators. So thanks to the Flatiron team. Get out of here. It gets late. <laughs> thank you. Are. No, not at all. It was an honor. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, it's late, uh, so I won't, I won't take up too much uh, time. They've already kind of gone through uh, the project flow, but there's a website for uh, University of Colorado Cancer Center Flatiron Projects uh, that Jessica Figura will send out a link to. Um, there is a joint steering committee. Uh, you know, we're hoping just to get a flood of these things, but we just want any uptake of the database. And, and the, really the goal of the joint steering committee is to make sure that the resources are there. Uh, to be able to perform the research with Flatiron that you want to uh, perform. Uh, there are three ways to request access to explore. Um, you know, Jessica will be sending out a link. It sounds like Flatiron will be as well. Uh, but you can complete the Flatiron uh, new user request form. Uh, and that link is going to go out after this meeting. You can always email the program coordinator, who is Jessica Figura, who's on this call right now. Um, and then investigators can actually refer other investigators directly on explore. Uh, and you can kind of see Jessica's uh, screenshot here uh, of doing that. Like I said, there's no cost to this, right? The Cancer Center is supporting the cost of the Flatiron platform, as well as the partnership with UC Health. And so really the only thing that you're really gonna potentially have to pay for is the biostatistics support. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's why when you submit this form for the initial inquiry, uh, they're asking what biostatistics group you'll be working with. Um, but that's basically it. I know. Uh, you know, some questions have already been asked, but before we adjourn, just wanted to see if anybody had any questions uh, before we get you all out of here. Chris, this is Stacey. I just wanted to add one more thing, just as an FYI. So when we were piloting Chris's project through this the system, um, Jessica and I will help to get the scope of work routed. So you won't have to worry about doing that piece. Um, we will help with that. And then we found that because the data sets do um, include dates of uh, dates of diagnosis, dates of treatment, Comer um, does not consider that to be identifiers. And so we do have to submit these projects to Comerb, which um, Jessica and I will help you with and actually do for you with your assistance. So um, as Chris was saying, we're trying to build sort of, this is a pretty easy to use system. The Explorer system is actually quite good. Um, just for navigating and the Flatiron team has been great to work with. And then we're going to set up our team to help support you in those submission process steps as well. And the IRB approval comes pretty quick. Yeah. 
Chris's project, yeah, Chris's project was deemed exempt, which is what I definitely expected. We're able to submit them as secondary use projects, which the application is very brief. Um, and so um, I think we, we have a really good process um, getting laid out to help get these through pretty quickly. Well, great, everybody. Happy Valentine's Day. And I uh, hope you guys have a good evening. And thanks for joining again uh, with, uh, with this meeting and uh, come up with any ideas that you guys can for Flatiron. So thanks, thank everybody. You. Oh, sorry, Anthony? No, no, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.